Hello everyone, welcome back to the Glossix Spotlight, where we dive deep into the nexus of customer experience and technological innovation. Today's episode is especially exciting, and believe me, you want to hang on to every word. In the world of customer experience where empathy and technology intersect, few names shines as brightly as Dr. Hoy Wu Curtis. As the CEO of Support You, Dr. Wu Curtis has redefined what it means to lead with compassion and forward thinking in a tech-driven era. Today, she's here to share her wealth of knowledge and experience with us. With over two decades of strategic leadership across various industries, Dr. Wu Curtis has championed the integration of innovative technology and operational excellence to drive organizational growth. Her unique approach? Putting employees first, creating a ripple effect of exceptional customer service that is both heartfelt and efficient. At Support You, she's been at the forefront of constructing a company culture that is supportive as it's innovative focusing on seamless onboarding, comprehensive training, and ensuring the success of their stuff. The people-first model is not just the foundation of Support You's business strategy. It's the secret sauce to the remarkable performance for clients. So before we dive in into this insightful conversation, do yourself a favor and explore what Support You is all about. From their commitment to creating opportunities for an untapped diverse workforce workforce for their cutting-edge technical stack designed to empower their people in leadership, their story is one of inspiration and transformation. So, without further ado, let's extend a warm classic spotlight welcome to Dr. Hui Wu Curtis. Dr. Wu Curtis, it's an absolute honor to have you here with us today. Yeah, thank you so much. Wow, quite an introduction, but uh, very happy to be here, and thank you so much for this opportunity. It's my pleasure, and I really try my best with the intros. Um, before we get into the heart of our discussion today, um, is there anything new you're particularly excited about or any upcoming project that you're eager to share with our audience today? You know, no, not, not particularly. I, I mean, I think it's just really kind of seeing where like technology and AI and all the opportunities that we can see and, and how much we can push outside kind of normal boundaries and comfort zones. So I always look for opportunities to be able to kind of do that. Yeah. So for our listeners today, today's episode is called Revolutionizing CX with Empathy and AI, a deep dive with Dr. Louis Wu Curtis. So we usually talk a lot in this podcast about the intersection between AI and CX, but today we're going to blend in your expertise when it comes to empathy in CX and AI, and of course, the world of contact centers. So I think we'll just, you know, jump right in. And I think that I want to start with the first question is, as the CEO of Support You, you've positioned the company uniquely by centering around employee experience. Can you share like the in- inspiration behind this approach and how it has shaped your leadership strategy? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Happy to. You know, I, I think when, when we kind of look at our industry, there's been so many different kind of buzzwords, right? For, for a while now, it was, you know, CX and customer experience and kind of how we can really innovate and transform. And then it kind of came full circle to now EX, right? Employee experience and how, you know, from COVID, we really kind of understood what, um, what employees that were kind of going through and then the impacts of their efforts really to kind of the rest of the, the business world. And taking EX into consideration, there was a lot of talk about what the benefits are and um, and what it was supposed to do, but there was really no kind of tangible solution or tangible approach to really kind of defining what EX stood for. And so, you know, coming from the front lines, I never, I never forget my roots and I never forget about how tough it is to be on the phones, to be on the front lines, dealing with the customers day in and day out. So I had the opportunity to create my own company and made the conscious decision really to focus on the employee first. And, it's, and I, I hate that cliche, but it really shows kind of our focus on what's most important in our organization because without them, we have no business. And so I took it one step further saying, you know, as we make investments into our technology stack, everything and anything that makes up our technology stack must help our employees and our leadership. 
So it has to help them with the onboarding. It has to make their transition to our company seamless and effortless. And all of these um, combined solutions have to be able to kind of make them be productive, shorten that learning curve, and really fully support them as they enter into our organization and as they support different accounts and different campaigns. And so if it didn't help our employees or it didn't help catapult their success, then it was something we just didn't consider. So we were able to kind of design it from the ground up, an entire company that was specifically focused on employees. And in turn, if we can lower those barriers, increase the probability of success, and really develop a strong culture to where they feel and they see how much we've dedicated to them, then they in turn are so much more engaged and loyal and, and now in turn are able to really kind of deliver that, that customer experience to our clients. I absolutely love that. And I, and I couldn't agree more. And I think that to your point, delivering this stellar CX that we always hear about, that we always crave for as customers of a, of a brand or of a company, I think it all starts from the employee, the employee experience. The EX is so crucial. I think that what I would love to know, I think one of the most important questions that our listeners might have right now is like, as leaders of you know small businesses or medium-sized businesses or even enterprises, how do you deliver that at scale? Do you think it's easier to, to deliver an exceptional EX in a smaller enterprises than a larger ones, or it kind of varies from one to another? Yeah, I, w- I would say it definitely varies. I mean, I've seen a lot of small to medium-sized companies. They understand the value of, of the employees itself, but are, are really kind of constrained to their budgets and to kind of directionally kind of where they want to head to. And sometimes it takes a bit of convincing because if you have, you know, small business owners, and I'm, I'm going to generalize this, but the small business owners that I've kind of encountered, you know, again, are willing to make their money and their investments in other areas and not necessarily the employees, right? It's things to kind of help deliver kind of the bells and whistles to clients. But what about internally looking in as to kind of what they need to do their job successfully. So it's a little hard in that aspect. It just depends on where their focus is. And obviously on a large, a much larger enterprise, there's always different competing priorities and resources and budgetary constraints in terms of what you want to focus on for the new upcoming year and what's the the value of it. And are you going to see a, a good strong ROI in comparison to other departments that are vying for those resources as well. So it's it's a tough go at it. And I'm not saying any one environment is easier or harder. I think it it just takes a bit of vision. And I think it takes a bit of planning to be able to understand what your roadmap looks like. And then where does that EX fall in terms of importance? And then how do you loop it around to now it has to benefit the company? And so what's in it for our organization if we choose this particular path? So it's about setting up kind of the right business case. Totally. And with your extensive experience in strategic leadership and operational excellence, what specific strategies have you employed to ensure that AI implementations and customer service don't just innovate, but also align with core business values? Yeah, I would say, you know, most organizations, they, you know, they either want to continue to be profitable, they want to continue to grow. Um, things that kind of impact their bottom line to be as as efficient and cost effective as possible, right? Those are all really important. How you get to those end results can vary pretty dramatically in terms of all the the tools and the resources that we have. So I always break it down to like three, you know, three major categories that that most people see it as. One is that it's the people piece, and then it's like the workflow processing piece, and then the final piece is the technology, which probably has the smallest percentage. Um, of the three, because it's it's a vehicle to help you do things. It's not the final solution that's going to save you at the end of the day. So when you're looking at overall strategy, I always look at internally and externally. You know, what are all the different things internally that we have at our disposal that we can really leverage for greater insights and information that's going to help me make better business decisions and help me craft my strategy? 
Yeah, so, I love So you, you're actually saying that you must look on the outside and then in the inside and then kind of try to align these strategies to make sense and resonates with the people that are eventually going to have to adopt to this new technology. Yeah, absolutely. Because I, I think that, you know, far too often you see organizations, they, you know, n- no matter how much they they try to be cross-functional, you know, it's, it's always kind of a, a daily challenge. And to really work cross-functionally and making sure that every customer touch point from A to Z, wherever they are in the organization, is consistent and flows well and is complementary. Because most people, most larger organizations, and I've had them say this to me too, is, oh, well, that customer experience, that's, that's a customer service issue. Well, not really. Because when customers are dealing with, let's say, the utility company, they don't care what department they're talking to. They just see it as that utility company. And so touch points vary and different departments get into play, whether it be customer service for a billing question or whether they're sending a truck to your house because they have repairs to make. That all wraps up to the entire customer experience. And it's hard for organizations to go grapple on the fact that it's all of our responsibilities to contribute to a stellar customer experience. And that takes the participation and the buy-in of all departments. I want to touch on your your previous sentence when you said you hear that quite often, CX is a customer service problem or issue. I love when people say that because the, then I make them realize that first of all, CX is cross-departmental. Even if it's not cross-departmental, if it's not adopted as the main business objective for every department, be it customer success, be it marketing, be it sales. And I want to touch on the sales side of things for a second because you kind of hear that a lot probably from sales leaders saying that. Um, maybe it's the same for you, but I know it's it's very much for me. The majority are salespeople. And then the one thing I say is, okay, so forget about cross-selling and forget about upgrading and forget about, you know, sell more to your existing customers because CX is not there. And you are a part of it. So yeah. that's kind of my my point on your point referring to CX as a customer service problem. I love that. You know, it's 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 become vague almost, um, especially in the past, you know, three years, I guess, for me. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I definitely agree with you. I, mean, I think it's, you know, to me, it is... Any time that you have to interact with a with a customer, right? Um, anybody can buy that technology. Anybody can buy whatever platforms they want. But really, it's it boils down to, you know, their interactions with with both the technology piece and the people piece. And I think if you're willing to build genuine connections and really understand the customer and listen to kind of what their needs are they're going to be much more loyal to you because you're really listening to what their concerns and their problems are instead of just, you know, focusing on forcing them to, you know, buy something that they may not need or cross-selling something. But if you sit there and you can validate some of their concerns or some of their issues, and then really from a, a consultative approach, then recommend these solutions and stuff, they're much more inclined to, to buy from you because they, they trust your opinion. They trust that you have their best interest in mind. And I, I yes. do think what it boils down to is a people game. Yeah, and it's empathy and it's genuine care and it's and it's listen to understand and not listen to respond. And I can throw hundreds like this, but I, I can agree. I, I, I totally agree. It's It's about how you understand and how you act on your customer needs. I, I, I totally agree with you. And- has someone who has directed B2B and B2C contact centers worldwide, what unique challenges have you faced in implementing AI across the different cultural contexts? You know, like how have you tailored your approach to meet diverse customer expectations? Yeah, I, I would say I, I don't I don't know if we've come up with that magic formula or the solution, but I think we're keenly aware of, of some of the challenges. Now, part of it is because AI is such a hot topic right now. It's where do you use it and where do you apply it? Because there's there's so many different use cases and it all sounds fantastic, right? To be able to 
take all that data and aggregate it and really let machine learning or natural language kind of take its course to be able to kind of help deliver you know, that, that service and that support to customers. But when you kind of scale it down, you have to make sure that your organization is prepared to be able to kind of feed into those systems. You know, I've always thought people who have ran and led call centers, you know, we've always been seen as a huge cost center. You know, it cost our organization just, you know, a ton of, ton of money, uh, a huge chunk of our budget. And so people never wanted to spend more money in, in terms of support and service. But if we had to take a step back where else in the, really in the organization, are you going to get thousands and, and millions of transactions in, in one area? And that just serves as a huge goldmine of information. And so us as contact center leaders have to be able to take that data, aggregate it, and, and really do some great analysis on it because we can be strategic. We can be in the forefront of now with all the information that we've gathered now serve that back to the other departments, whether it be sales or e-commerce or marketing in terms of what worked, what didn't work, what are they hearing with the customers, what resonated the most. You know, there's there's so much that you can glean out of that information that will help you drive better business decisions, help you drive certain directions. And so I would say going back to your question specifically, it is a figuring out where you want AI to play within your operations. And I always say start small. You know, I always start internally because that's what I have the most control over. And so there's been a lot of great solutions out there to, to help with our, um, with our employees in terms of how they deliver the work. And I'll use one example, um, knowledge bases. You know, organizations, some have great knowledge bases, some don't have any. Some kind of piece it together. I'm sure we're all used to seeing, you know, an agent's desktop or their screen where they have a ton of post it notes around the edges, you know, with little notes and little hints for themselves. And I think in those situations, those scenarios, there's so much information and so much disparate systems that our employees kind of have to keep straight in their head that it makes information really tough to find. And so if you can, take a tool like a knowledge base and have an AI backend and help them learn about or help them assist in what's the next best action for them. And then the tool continues to learn from it. I think that's a great place to start. And then once you kind of get a better foothold of, of where AI plays within your, your processes, then you can extend it to other areas more externally as long as you understand what system it's coming from, and if you're prepared to have good, clean data go into those to those AI systems. Yes, to- totally. And I love your example about the agents with the small side notes. So it's kind of, I'm, I'm laughing because it's kind of what we are tackling right now. So about 10 months ago, we launched our conversational AI suite. And we do have quite a handful of features when it comes to AI, but one of these features is that we are able to use GPT-4 engine coupled with our conversational AI algorithms within our platforms to allow support agents to have what's so-called auto-generated suggested replies. So the auto-generated suggested replies, um, basically the way it works is that an incoming support ticket is, is, is showing up on the agent screen. And then instead of typing in an answer or using a knowledge base, the AI um, actually analyzes the context of the customer query and then suggests anywhere between two to four different answers for the agent, most appropriate answers, of course, to the agents to choose from. And then anything that the agent needs to do is just to one click and then boof it's replied. And that's kind of um, what we do in terms of helping agents not being using the, you know, side notes or crumbling in their notebooks or, you know, trying to figure out what would be the best answer to, to reply to any question. Great. And in your view, how can companies ensure that empathy remains at the core of customer experience strategies, especially as AI and automation became increasingly prev- prevalent in customer interactions. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, when you look at the executives or people in the leadership that are making most of the decisions, um, you know, they tend to get further and further away of, w- of what the actual work really is or some of the dynamics. And I kind of balance that out with, you know, not only having a larger 10,000 foot view of things and developing strategy, but there are also times where you kind of have to dig in and see things at a more granular level, granular level uh, within your operations. And so, you know, a lot of it is is working with a leadership team we like to do call studies. We like to do speech analytics. We like to see how um, or if there is a stronger propensity of customers to act, to buy, to be more loyal um, as we kind of change our approach or our style. And, and many of that kind of includes an increased level of empathy. And then how do we continue to fine tune our our scripting or our recordings or whatever we serve up in self-service or even in our IVR or introductions into before they get transferred to an agent, um, how do we make that more customer-centric, more humanizing? Because I think that is so much more well-received. And we've done a lot of different studies in terms of trying kind of different approaches and different tones um, and different kind of wordings even to see where that's most effective. And so I think we've seen leaps and bounds improvements. The more we stick with, the more we continue to to evolve that that entire empathy piece. Yeah, I I, I love that, and I think that um, one of the things that we do um, here that we try to tackle here is that we implement the generative AI chatbots. So one of our core products is actually the chatbot builder. Um, and one of the things that we try to tackle is actually one of the industry's uh, most pressing issues is that, you know, that when you come to a bot and you start a conversation and then um, it says, oh, sorry, I do not understand you. And then it goes back in the loop, right? Yes. Uh, so what we try to do here is that we try to implement, well, we actually implemented GPT-4 into the chat bots. So you'll get an answer. I actually wrote an article uh, that's called 14 Surprises Answers from um, Generative AI Chatbot. So we collected funny responses from funny questions or weird questions, if you wish, that customers asked our customers from different verticals and, and on different occasions. And it was quite funny. You know, people try to test out and see how smart the chatbot really is or if it's going to have any, you know, um, repetition or it's not going to understand the context of the of the question or anything like that and we i can say we really succeed in this because you do get an answer so for example a person asks can you tell me the next lottery winning numbers for the next lottery uh rifle right um right and and then the the chatbot says i'm not a sidekick but you can try and ask chat gpt like, you know, or something like that, <laughs> is, which is creative in a way, right? And it yeah. still keeps the customer engaged, right? Even if it's, even if they if they try to troll it, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. So we try to make it a funnier or let's say a more amusing or a more humanized experience than the regular chatbot provides. So that's kind of like, you know, how we try to implement the the human touch or a bit more empathy in 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 automated chatbots, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. You know, even I just as early as yesterday, you know, as I'm online um, interacting with a chatbot and it's so clunky and it it was just hard. I like I I always wonder and I always ask my team itself like. Once they've implemented something or designed something and, and they do the rigorous testing and all that stuff, it's like, have you ever gone through it as a customer? Because it's very eye-opening when you as a customer are sitting in there in their place and in their lens, um, actually go through the sequence of steps on on kind of like that that generative AI chatbot. And it'll be it'll be enlightening if you go through it. Yeah. No, I agree. Look, we did a lot of tests and we really try to to put a human element into it just to say that our chatbot don't suck, you know, because let's be honest, 
no one really likes the automated um, uh, experience. Like the majority of people do not like the automated experience, but on the contrary, again, that's what we found is that a lot of people also don't really want to talk over the phone with a customer service representative or whoever is going to help them, right? They want to have an immediate experience. They want to have automated experience. But on the other hand, they also want to have a speedy experience that resonates, that is resolving their wish in a timely manner. And I think that, you know, chatbots that are not, let's say, generative AI or powered by AI cannot really achieve that in today's world. Yeah, you're 100% right. I mean, you know, I work in a call center day in and day out, and the last thing I want to do is spend my off hours talking to somebody else. Yeah. So balancing a remarkable career with a rich personal life, what advice would you give to aspiring CX leaders, especially women and mothers aiming to make a mark in the industry while maintaining world-like harmony? I know that you do that very well, I noticed that, and please spill the beans. <laughs> I don't know if I have like that that magic potion, you know. I mean, I I definitely have, you know, put my career on a bit of a pause while we were raising kids, and you know, my husband and I we have five kids, and we have busy lives, and and it, there was always kind of a a struggle in terms of being a good mom, being a good parent, and then being able to raise your kids. Um, and also figuring out, like, where do I want my identity to be outside of just my home life? Because I loved working and I loved our industry. And so it was just a matter of time when the kids got a little bit older that I now decide, OK, this is the right time to so now continue to learn more and be more aggressive in terms of climbing that corporate ladder. And so it's it's never too late to do that. And especially women, we have a hard time balancing kind of the mom guilt and kind of where we want to be career-wise. But, yeah, you know, I would say for, for folks in our industry, like nobody has purposefully out of the gate said, I want to work in a call center. We've all either been promoted and the call center has been part of that, or we've just kind of stumbled in it. And for whatever reason, you know, whether you like it or not, you know, now we find ourselves in the call center business. And because there's so many things that were just kind of born there, like we just inherited, we inherited service levels, we inherited the QA monitoring form, we inherited kind of these KPIs, is take a step back and fundamentally ask yourself to the, you know, go to the root of it, which is, is, are these kind of the right measures? And I always recommend to people, it's like, take a step back and really kind of peel back the pieces, because just like with society and our marketplace and our, our companies, things are continually evolving, but yet our call centers are still ran the same way for the last 30 years. And and so I also recommend people to, it's like, get outside your four walls and go learn. You know, there's so many great workshops, podcasts, conferences that you can, you can get great information on to kind of help you do your job and help you do your job better. And so I think be, being able to kind of capitalize on all those things, I don't have all the answers, but I have, I still have great mentors, um, several mentors that I easily can call upon and kind of ask questions and kind of work through. That's going to make me a better leader and a better manager for my folks. And, and so I always, I'm always learning every single day about different ideas and concepts and stuff and you can't stop learning because there's so many things that are evolving, like with your your platform with the classics. I mean, there's so many wonderful tools and resources that you may not be in the market right now to buy it, but you have to understand it and put it on your roadmap in consideration. So when the right time does come, then you, you're able to kind of make that business case because you know what the technology is and you know the direction of the market and you know the shifts in terms of customer experience. Yes, 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 exactly. And leaders, if you listen to this, stay foot. No one had that figured out. Trust me. Trust Dr. Curtis as well. And I, I have to ask you that, like before we we hang up, I, I I just have to have to have your your thoughts on this. So, where do you see call center agents and call centers as a whole are are approaching in the next? 
three years? Are we going to see support agents that are like mastering the art of AI and all of their work is evolving and around tools that are based on AI? Or is it really going to be there in about two, three, or even four years time? Yeah, I would, you know, I would say it depends on, it depends on the, the contact center leader and their leadership team and what the main goals and objectives are for that particular company. I would say there's some remarkable people in our space that have made strong commitments in leveraging and implementing AI successfully uh, within several areas and several departments of their organization. And so those leaders are going to continue to push the envelope and see, you know, true benefits, leaps and bounds. But I, I would say in order to get into the game, you have to be part of the game and and be able to take that leap of faith to, to you know, dip your feet in it and, and just to try to see kind of where it fits in and how it works. But call centers in three years, it's interesting that you ask that because, you know, when you when you look at the fundamental running of a contact center and all the pieces and elements of it, again, not much has changed in the last 30, 35 years. But you think about the trajectory of technology that we've seen that has changed pretty dramatically for contact centers, and yet very few contact centers have either adopted the technology or have done a good job in terms of implementing that technology and implementing it well. So I think we're still going to, you know, three years from now, still struggle a little bit in terms of where we kind of see fit in terms of this, this AI piece, because there's there's so many different areas of utility for this particular solution that to me, the, the leaders, they have to be able to, you know, distinguish what all the different solutions lie. I would say break it up into smaller segments to saying, okay, what are the use cases of what you're trying to solve for? And then take incremental steps to continue to improve your operations. So in the next three years, I, I see us incrementally improving, not leaps and bounds. But I think as an industry, you know, we just continue to be a bit slow in terms of these adoptions and in terms of really being able to to innovate and kind of push the envelope. Yeah, wow. I I I think we're on the same page here. I think pretty much the same. I think today we're a little bit more struggling with the implementation of AI in contact center technology and actually trying to figure out all the issues we're trying to solve in the contact center with technology, with the help of technology. But yeah, I think I, I would agree, and and I think that we'll we'll still we'll be in a better place for sure than today. Uh, but I think it's it's gonna take a, a few more years uh, until we see a complete adoption, if at all. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I really want to thank you for joining us today. It was such an insightful conversation for our listeners. If you want to have more insights on contact centers, call centers, CX, and AI. I urge you to follow Dr. Ruth Curtis um, on her LinkedIn. She's very active there. Thank you so much for joining us.